A few weeks ago, Chicago's very own Chance the Rapper was on Saturday Night Live, where he performed a short musical number called Come Back Barack. I don't know if you saw it. Now, I can assure you that Chance is not the only person who is nostalgic for those Obama years in the White House, but I'm actually going to stick my neck out as I stand here and guess that our guest speaker is actually not one of them. So after all, to me, being president of the United States is really important, but I think being an ex-president is probably really great. <laughs> you get to write books, you no longer have to wear ties, the hours seem to be much better, and from what I hear, the pay is a lot better too. <laughs> the 44th president does not meet, need much of an introduction to this hometown crowd, but I'm going to review a few highlights just for the record. As many of you know, he was born and raised in Hawaii, spent part of his childhood in Indonesia, finished college at Columbia in New York, and then started his career as a community organizer in Chicago. Lucky us. After a few years, he went back to school to earn a law degree at Harvard, where he was also the first African-American editor of the Harvard Law Review. A lot of firsts. After Harvard, many would say he achieved his life's greatest success. He married Michelle. A few years later, as we all know, he launched a political career that took him from the Illinois State Senate to the White House in just 12 short years. As he entered office, we also remember he had inherited one of the worst and most troubled economies in U.S. history and guided us, guided us back to prosperity over two terms that included 76 straight months of job growth, a historic streak that continues to the present day. On his watch, unemployment dropped from 10% to under 5% as 15 million jobs were added in the United States. The stock market, which we know a little about, also surged from 8,000 to 20,000 in those eight years. Pretty remarkable. As many know, he was a fierce protector of the environment while simultaneously helping us to end America's dependence on foreign oil. He extended health care coverage to over 20 million uninsured Americans. Both at home and abroad, he fought hard for justice, fairness, tolerance, and freedom. Those, of course, are the universal values that have anchored our society. In an increasingly diverse country, his election symbolized the boundless promise of America where anything is possible, that you can go from obscurity to the highest level of office in our country. As a loving husband and devoted father, he presented a wholesome, and positive image of the African-American family at a time when our culture often showed more negative depictions. As Chicagoans and as Americans, he always made us proud. As one who travels widely, I can attest to the respect he commanded and continues to command around the world. And yes, his absence is painfully felt in a political environment where hateful rhetoric is increasingly becoming normalized. Today, President Obama lives in Washington, where his second daughter is completing high school. Although he's currently writing a book at just 56 years of age, I think it's safe to say that he has many chapters left. And one of those chapters will take place right here on the south side of Chicago, where he's building the Presidential Center that will not only memorialize his histor historic life in politics, but also inspire a brand new generation to engage in pu public service. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. He's coming from somewhere. We may need to go find the president. Right. He's coming, she's saying, one minute. 
One minute? This was timed exactly, but I think I got a little ahead. One minute? Talk amongst yourselves. I feel like they need like Jeopardy music or something. This is rough. All right, any minute now, I promise. I don't know how I know that, but I know he's in the building. Maybe he wants to make this kind of entrance. Or he just wants me to sweat. Uh, President Obama, there he is, thank God. He's killing me. Hey, uh, what happened? I'm literally sweating. Like my pits are wet. How how long how long were you at here? Five minutes. Five minutes. Well, I'm sorry. I. I just did what I was told. I, he said he was slow walking. I, I wandered over here. Uh, it was true that a, a bunch of the servers were folks that I saw when I was uh, like a state senator. And I had one of those seats in the back. But they remembered me, uh, which was nice. Hard to forget. I was very appreciative, so I wanted to... So, so I had some hands to shake on the way in. We have a lot to cover. We do. Let's go. The world is crazy. So I want to start, however, um, a little soft, because I think that uh, a lot of people feel like they really know you, because we saw you and see you very regularly. And during the time you were president, basically every day. So I think we assume a lot. Right. So I wanted to start by literally a lightning wrong round just to ask you some questions so that we could really know. I'm ready. Okay. Do you prefer, are you one of these early morning people or are you a late night person? Night owl. Do you like, I know this answer because I'm seeing what you're drinking, coffee or tea? Tea. Are you a mountains or beach person? That's obvious. Come on, I'm from Hawaii. What are you, what are you talking about? I mean, mountains are nice, but... Thin crust or deep dish? Thin crust. With a fork or no fork? <laughs> fork or no fork? Uh, for, first of all, for those, for those of you who are deep dish, I love deep dish. But, but let's face it, deep dish isn't really pizza. <laughs> deep dish. This is Chicago. Deep, deep dish is uh, like a full blown, uh, it's like lasagna with crust. <laughs> it's delicious, but it's not a slice, right? You got to eat it with a knife and fork. Sweet, I'm sorry, continue. Sweet or salty? Sweet uh, or salty. salty? Okay, me too. Superman or Batman? Batman. Wonder Woman or Catwoman? Got to be Wonder Woman. Well, I mean, are we dating or marrying? <laughs> I'd have to think about that. <laughs> Michael Jackson or Prince? Prince. Prince. Last one, Shakespeare or Tupac? Shakespeare. I, I, you know, uh, no, I, I love hip hop, but, but it's Shakespeare. Come on. I <laughs> oh, mean, that, that one was a little... All right. A little too easy. So the other sort of mundane thing I want to ask about, just because we don't quite understand what it's like to live in the White House. So for us, like, our cable never works. For some reason, our TVs never work yeah. in Chicago or San Francisco. Was there some kind of mundane thing in the White House that just, like, bugged you that Oh, never absolutely. Worked? Like what? Well, first of all, one thing that people, I think, are not aware of is it's wonderful that you get 
uh, free housing. It's nice. <laughs> Although, keep in mind, I, I maintain my residence here, so we we're still you know, paying our mortgage here in Chicago and property taxes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but everything else you pay for. You know, uh, you know, the milk in the fridge, the toilet paper, uh, and, and, and the staff, if they stay over, uh, let's say you're having a dinner party, you know, uh, you're paying them overtime, and, and, and they became like family. Uh, the point is, it's not as cheap as you think living in the White House. <laughs> uh, you, know, you end up running a deficit, I just, I just want to point out. Um, but you're kind so, of making so that's, up for so it. That's so something, that's something that people don't know. Um, it is an old house, uh, and, and there's, a, there's engineers there to, to, if anything needs to be fixed, but things have to be fixed. So, for example, there was one, this is probably the first time I ever told this story publicly. Um, uh, Sunday morning, and I'm trying to sleep in because, you, you know, you're sleep deprived uh, in this job, and Sasha comes in, she must have been 12 at the time, and she says, uh, Daddy, it's, it's raining in the dining room. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm kind of groggy, and I'm thinking, uh, I don't know, it's raining outside. I don't know, exactly. maybe it's a metaphor for something, I don't know. <laughs> no, Daddy, it's raining. <laughs> so we go into the dining room, and it is raining in the dining room. <laughs> uh, and a, a old water main had burst on the third floor, and it was coming through the light fixtures oh. in, in sort of a gusher, and there was about two inches of water on the, on the floor. Uh, and stuff like that would happen on Regularly. a fairly regular basis. Um, and it would get fixed, but it's an old house, you know? It's, yeah. So, when you think about the world and where we are today, and what you left behind. Um, I heard that you just went around the world, literally, literally. You just went from Washington to China and India and all these Paris, et cetera. Um, how do you see the world now from the perspective of being a citizen as opposed to a perspective of being a president? And I'm gonna give a caveat to that. I told Bill Daly I was going to invoke his name here. Bill Daly once told me that we, our politics really do reflect our time, and we have to accept that, and we get the politics that we want and deserve. So as you go out and you look in the world, you're traveling, you're a rock star wherever you go, but you're a regular citizen, how do you see this versus being inside of that White House, even with its leaky, you know, pipes? Well, uh, when you're in the job, then uh, every day when you pick up the newspaper or watch the news, whatever is on there is your problem, literally. Uh, and so uh, uh, you, you're training your mind to think, all right, is this something that we can do about, uh, something about immediately? What, uh, levers of power can you pull or push in order to have an impact? Uh, and, and you just have a, you have to have a very uh, disciplined, practical approach to problems. Uh, and, and you have to, to some degree, compartmentalize your emotions around issues in order to just get through the day uh, because you're dealing with five crises uh, at any given moment. Um, Literally, moment, every, not a day. No, no, every moment. There's, there's four or five things that are going kerplooey, and, and you've got you to do something about it. Um, you have the luxury as a private citizen to step back and um, reflect more, I think, on uh, the, the details and the meaning uh, of what's happening, um, because it's not your responsibility necessarily to solve it. Uh, the, the other, the, the, the thing that doesn't change though, I, I, I feel it as acutely now as I felt uh, when I was president, is I, when people often ask me what surprised me most about being president. 
And uh, the truth is, the fact that there was hard work didn't surprise me. The fact that basically uh, decisions wouldn't reach my desk unless nobody else could solve them. Uh, if they could be solved, somebody else would have solved it already. Uh, and so there's, you were always dealing with problems that uh, didn't lend themselves to a simple solution and you were working with probabilities and you had to make your best judgment knowing that not everything was going to work out exactly as you had wanted. All that stuff, it didn't surprise me that much. The, the thing that, that did strike me is how much America and the American government underwrite uh, the world order. I think we underestimate this. Um, things don't happen internationally if we don't put our shoulder behind the wheel. If, if you go to a G20 meeting, which is the gathering of the top economies in the world, uh, if you go to an environmental meeting, if there is a special uh, committee on refugees in the United Nations, uh, the Ebola crisis, does a typhoon in the Philippines, wh whatever it is, no other country has the combination of bandwidth and experience and um, ideals that uh, permit it to, to mobilize the world to solve a problem. And so what happens then, just to finish up, is if, if the U.S. isn't doing it, it's not happening. Um, and Ebola is probably the, the best example of this. Uh, we didn't just make a contribution to solve Ebola. We had to organize the entire world community. We had to build a tarmac to, for the planes to land. We had to send in our entire uh, CDC and uh, medical teams. We had to guarantee the medevacking out of uh, European doctors and healthcare workers for them to be willing to participate. China couldn't deliver whatever it was going to deliver without us being able to provide the logistics for it. Uh, and we probably saved a million lives by doing that. But, but I think that's how much uh, our, our government and our democracy uh, holds things together. And sometimes we take that for granted. In, in, and, and understandably, sometimes we're frustrated because it feels like other countries aren't doing, carrying their weight or they're free riders or what have you, but it's pretty important. Um, and, 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 and that I continue to experience as I travel around the world. So does it worry you when you think about the populist rhetoric, the nationalism that is taking hold or taking off in lots of different parts of the world. Yes, it and, worries me. And I, why do you think that is happening? Well, uh, uh, I'm not the first one to observe that we've had this combination of globalization and rapid technological change that's accelerating, and it has dis disrupted economies and disrupted cultures at a pace that's probably the fastest in human history. I mean, the transition from the agricultural era to the industrial age was pretty tumultuous. It was a big transition, but it took place over the course of 100, 150 years. Um, we're going through similar kinds of changes in the span of 20, or maybe shorter, when you start thinking about what's going to be happening with artificial intelligence and driverless cars and you name it. So you have that, and, and then you have this, this uh, technological revolution around information. And, and if you look at, somebody had an interesting observation. Every time there's been a revolutionary new information technology, whether it was the printing presses or radio or television, um, it takes a while to absorb that into a culture and people react to it and, because it's powerful. Uh, it's, it's a powerful way of transmitting stories and narratives 
And, and right now, we're seeing a collision of cultures that we're not accustomed to. It used to be that if you weren't, uh, if you were very conservative, Muslim or Christian or Jew or Hindu, uh, you could live in your community and people didn't question your assumptions. Now, over the internet, you're, you're seeing your kid watch, I don't know, Little Uzi rapping. That's a rapper, by the way. If you, <laughs> if you had a 16-year-old, you would know who Little Uzi was. Um, and the lyrics are astonishing, and there's just a whole bunch of stuff going on there, and you're thinking, what is the world coming to? And, and so the, the combination of, of economic disruption, cultural disruption, uh, nothing feels solid to people. Um, that's a recipe for people wanting to find uh, security somewhere. And, and sadly, there is something, I think, in, in all of us that um, looks for simple answers when we're agitated and insecure. And, and far too often, what we look for is some way of reasserting our superiority over somebody else. So we resort to tribes or sectarianism or nationalism, whatever ism makes us feel like we're more important, we have a better grasp of what's true than that person who's not like us. And, um, and that, I think, is a lot of what you're seeing uh, around the world. The good news is, is that, you know, right now we have competing narratives. The, the narrative that America as it, at its best has stood for, the narrative of pluralism and tolerance and democracy and rule of law and uh, you know, human rights and freedom of the press and freedom of religion. That narrative, uh, I think, is actually uh, the more powerful narrative. And the majority of people around the world uh, aspire to that narrative, which is the reason why people still want to come here. Uh, but we have to fight for it. It, 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 doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't happen automatically. And, and so when people think about our own institutions and our own culture and our own politics, the, the, the one thing that I always want to emphasize to people is not to take for granted uh, the institutions and norms and values that we've built. Uh, because it's not so much that they're fragile, but they are reversible. Um, I'll leave it at that. That was a long, that was a long answer. We should go back to the. Uh, uh, <laughs> we should go back to the lightning round. Do you think that when you think about some of these institutions that perhaps some do take for granted, maybe not, because these institutions today that are the pillars of the American system in very in every way are being challenged. Um, very vocally, very loudly, even though they are still revered around the world, some would say in our own, inside of our own country, they are being second-guessed. Yeah. Do you think that those institutions have a real risk today of going away? Is there a real threat to yeah. these core values? And, and, and what do you do about it today? What concrete thing, instead of, you know, we all are talking so much about what we're saying, what is to be done? Well, look, look um, it's important not to over-romanticize things. So when I talk about the values, ideals, institutions that uh, I revere, uh, that, that the things that make me most proud to be an American. Um, it's important to understand that those have always been contested. And there's always been competing narratives in, in our country, just like there are around the world. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that you and I would not be sitting here in front of the economic club. But because, that's actually the point. Your life, in many ways, yeah. romanticizes all of this, Well, right? but, but, but the, the, the point is, is that the progress that we make in strengthening these institutions is real, but episodically, at, at junctures in our history, 
whether because we're afraid or because uh, of external threats or uh, what have you, uh, they, they start teetering a little bit. Look, uh, uh, FDR is, is one of my political heroes. Uh, in my mind, uh, second greatest president after, after Lincoln. I'm an Illinois guy, what can I tell you? Um, but he, he interned a, a bunch of loyal Japanese Americans during World War II. That, that was a threat to our institutions. Uh, there have been periods in our history where censorship was uh, considered okay. Uh, we have the McCarthy era. You know, we had a president who had to resign prior to impeachment because he was undermining rule of law. That, at every juncture, we've had to wrestle with big problems, dating back to the Constitution, a founding document that uh, was revolutionary and declared all men were created equal, uh, that, that, the Declaration of Independence, the, the, the charter documents, but also contained the three-fifths clause. So, so we've always had some contradictions. That's part of human life. The, the question then is, at any given time, uh, what are we doing to defend uh, our best selves and, our, 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 uh, and those timeless values that should transcend party? So I would argue, for example, that freedom of the press is such an ideal. During my presidency, the press often drove me nuts. It wasn't just the conservative press that drove me nuts. Sometimes the liberal, quote unquote, press drove me nuts. There were times where I thought reporters were ill-informed. There were times where they didn't actually get the story right. But what I understood was that principle of the, the free press was vital. And that as president, part of my job was to make sure that that uh, was maintained. And, uh, and so, you know, we don't have time to go into detail about everything people should do. Um, uh, I, b b b but I wouldn't underestimate the very simple act of being engaged, paying attention, and speaking out. I, I mean, t t typically that's what it comes down to in a democracy. Um, and and, and I, I do think because we've been so wealthy and so successful that we get complacent and uh, assume that things continue the way they have uh, been uh, just automatically. And they don't. You have to tend to this garden of democracy, uh, otherwise uh, things can fall apart fairly quickly. Uh, and, 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 and we've seen societies where that happens, right? I mean, I, presumably there was a ballroom here in you know, Vienna in the late 1920s or 30s that looked pretty sophisticated right. and seemed as if, uh, you know, with the music and the art and the literature and the science that was emerging, it would continue into perpetuity. And then 60 million people died. Uh, and an entire world was plunged into chaos. So, you've got to pay attention and vote. <laughs> yep. Can you? I think a lot of people in this room are incredibly successful. They work extraordinarily hard. Mm -hmm. um, they leave nothing on the field every day. And yet, we cannot understand five crises a second. We just 
every moment. We cannot understand that. So can you help us understand, one, how did you maintain calm and peace? Because the one thing that I find whenever I have observed you is that you never seem frazzled. You never seem out of sorts. We don't see you angry, and I'm sure there are those moments, so I know you're a human being, but you wear and you wore the troubles very lightly, and there were a lot of troubles. How do you do that, or how did you do that? Um, well, it helps to be born in Hawaii, because <laughs> it's, uh, like the weather's really nice, and you're sitting there on the beach, you soak all that stuff in, um, and it makes you very chill. Um, I, 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 I do think some of it is temperament, and it's interesting. Uh, those of you who are parents know this experience. Yeah, you watch, uh, Michelle and I watch our daughters, and Michelle and I have very different temperaments, and we watch our daughters, and they have inherited different temperaments from each of us. Uh, and, and so, uh, 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 some of it, I think, is just hardwired. Uh, the, the most important thing for me, I, I don't think this is unique to the presidency. I suspect people in whatever their endeavors uh, uh, probably adapt similar tricks. Uh, for me, what I always found helpful and uh, was, I was able to sustain throughout my uh, presidency uh, was a focus on the long view. It, because it strikes me that uh, what frazzles people or leads them to snap judgments or anger is, is a, a, an obsession on the short term. And in the same way that a CEO, I think, makes a better decision if they have a long-term strategy, which isn't to say that they don't have to sweat the details of execution, but they understand that there are going to be ups and downs and you know, certain blind alleys you go down and setbacks, uh, but you're maintaining focus on whatever that North Star is. I, uh, I found that was useful for me to do, and I think it is most important in this era uh, where you are uh, where our society is constructed to entice you to be addicted to instant feedback, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's the nature really... of the information age. You've got a phone, somebody's giving you something. Is it, are, are you liked, are you disliked? Uh, it, uh, am I cute, am I not, uh, right? Um, and, and, and I think that, that mentality seeps into everything we do. I, uh, and I found it, uh, really useful. For example, I, I never watched uh, I never watched television news programs for eight years. Never. I, I mean, I was first. First of all, most of what I saw, uh, or most of what was reported, uh, I knew a long time ago, <laughs> and so it wasn't news to me. Um, But also, what, what, what was being, you know, by its nature, what you're being fed is something that's going to get a rise out of you. I mean, that, otherwise you're not... But you had to make a conscious decision. I remember you told me that, that yeah. in a gym you never have a CNN, nothing, Sports Center. nothing on television. Yeah. You made a conscious decision, though. I'm not yeah. starting my day that way. Yeah, and, but it wasn't a hard decision for me to make because it... <laughs> Um, and, and again, remember, I, I was defending freedom of the press, so, so this isn't a knock on the press. It, it, it's just that it was not helpful in me making decisions. Um, and so, so that was one. The, the only other thing that I'll mention, because I know we're, we're running short on time, uh, I found myself, for whatever, whatever reason, um, and again, some of this is just my sensibility, comfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, and I think that's hard for some folks. But 
let's take the economic crisis uh, that I walked into. And, and in fact, I was already having to function a little bit uh, in an executive capacity towards the end of my race in 2008 because crisis was happening. We were trying to get a rescue package in place. Um, President Bush was very weakened. I was talking to Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, and Bernanke uh, almost on a daily basis, um, as well as congressional leaders. Uh, the decisions that we made in that crisis, and pe people sometimes forget how bad it was, but the economy contracted faster than it did during the Great Depression. The financial system, if you look at various indicators, was imploding more severely than it did in 1929. Um, it, and the world was more interconnected than it was then, and, and more of on a hair trigger because of technology and capital moving uh, across borders rapidly. In those situations, I remember sitting with Tim Geithner and Larry Summers and others. Uh, Austin Goolsby here, is here. He was part of our team uh, somewhere around here. Uh, Austin helped save the economy. Take a bow, Austin. Um, uh, but he'll recall, as I do, we'd be in meetings with the, some of the smartest people on earth and have the best data possible, and yet most of the time the decisions I was making were 55-45 decisions. If we were lucky, it'd be a 60-40 decision, but oftentimes it was a 51-49 decision. Um, one specific uh, issue that Austin will remember, because he was deeply involved with, was for example, in terms of saving the auto industry, we had no doubt that we had to, that was worthwhile, yeah. Um, there, was, there was no doubt that we had to intervene heavily. We were gonna have to help the auto industry restructure. There was a significant question as to whether Chrysler could be salvaged, uh, or whether GM and Ford, who were in a much healthier position, uh, had to be our primary focus, and we had to play triage. And I remember us having several days of debate around this. And ultimately, you, you, you didn't know for sure. And being comfortable with the notion that you're never going to be sure, the same was true with the bin Laden raid, a 51-49 decision. You're never going to be sure. But what you can be sure about is you have You've taken the time to get the best information possible. You've surrounded yourself with the best people possible who are willing to challenge each other and challenge you so that you're leaving no un stone unturned. And if you've done that well, having confidence that the decision you make will be the best possible one that could be made in that circumstance, then you can sleep at night. Uh, also presuming that you're guided by uh, a set of principles or values that are important. And, and, and in the case of the president, the, the, the guiding value had to be what's good for the country as opposed to what was good for my poll numbers or what was good for uh, you know, how much flack I was going to be getting uh, as a consequence of the decision uh, or, or what it might do to my quote-unquote legacy somewhere off in the distance. Um, I, that had a soothing effect on me because, because then my, my general attitude was, all right, if I've, if I've checked all those boxes, then there's nobody that could be making a better decision than me. I, it may turn out that I'm wrong, but uh, I'm doing what was supposed to be done. We'll stop here and we'll right. continue in the next round. Stay tuned. Can I just remark, though, these chairs are a little too comfortable. <laughs> I'm still a little jet lagged, so I'm worried if I start sinking back, I'm going to. I don't think we think you're going to fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. So, one question that I wanted to ask you about, which was a follow up to what you just said about that you could sleep at night. 
When didn't you sleep at night? I was pretty good about sleeping. <laughs> um, was there an I, I, issue? Well, 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 we were talking earlier about uh, uh, whether I was a morning person or a night owl. So I'm, I'm a night owl, meaning I don't usually go to bed until like 1.30. And, uh, uh, and in the morning, I'm sort of incoherent. Uh, so typically my day, you know, I, I would start uh, in, in the White House gym, I'd work out, then I'd have breakfast, I would read what was called the Presidential Daily Briefing, which Michelle called my death book, because <laughs> basically it was a, it's a national security document that's prepared uh, that uh, includes anything that happened around the world overnight or any trends that uh, would pose a significant threat to uh, U.S. national security. Rough way to wake up and start the yeah, day. Yeah, and so you're reading, oh man, I, really, that's happening. Um, and then I go to the office, meetings work. At 6.30 I was, I was pretty disciplined about uh, coming home uh, and having dinner with the girls, and, and uh, which, which was a, a very important break for about an hour, hour and a half, and then I'd, I'd do my reading in, or writing in the evening, or telephone calls, and I'd uh, go till about 1.30. The, the point being, by the time I hit, my head hit the pillow, I was out. <laughs> I, I mean, it, 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 very rarely would it take me more than 10 minutes to get to sleep. Um, the, the, the issues that uh, gnawed on me, the, the, the ones that uh, I had, had to wrestle with and, and would internally at least become most emotional about, uh, typically had to do with uh, sending young men and women into war. Uh, when I came into office, uh, we had two active wars. Uh, Afghanistan was actually in a more perilous situation at that point in 2008. Uh, and uh, based on the recommendations of uh, our generals and uh, then Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, uh, I found it necessary to have to deploy actually more troops into Afghanistan. And I remember I made this announcement at West Point before a graduating class there. And uh, as I was speaking to these young people, I knew that as a consequence of the decision I was making, some of them might not come back. Or if they came back, uh, they might not be the same. Okay. And uh, those decisions weighed on me uh, and don't go away. Uh, because we also made it a practice of visiting uh, Walter Reed. Uh, and happily, by the end of my presidency, when I visited Walter Reed, typically there'd be only a handful of folks. Um, but at the beginning, I might spend three hours going from room to room to room to room, and you'd see 21-year-olds who had been shot and were paralyzed, uh, or, or uh, young men who'd, who'd lost not just one limb, but many. In fact, uh, at Walter Reed, uh, the, the folks who had just quote unquote lost a leg or an arm were considered more fortunate. Um, and there was no self-pity in them and there was extraordinary pride in their, uh, in their service and their families uh, could not have been prouder of them and more committed to their recovery. And, and there would be these happy stories of seeing folks who I'd first met just completely uh, torn up. Uh, and then two or three years later, they'd come walking uh, on prosthetics into the White House for some sort of event. And, and there was a great joy there. Uh, but there, uh, there was also just an extraordinary amount of uh, hardship. And the sense that you have to get these decisions right 
for them. That, that you have to uh, uh, do everything you can so that their sacrifices uh, are, are uh, in service of policies worthy of them. That, that would weigh on you. Uh, and, and there were times where uh, I would do some tossing and turning around that. So I've read and heard you say that the hardest day was the Sandy Hook day. And it's five years exactly to Sandy Hook on December 11th. So we're just a few days away. And that was a stunning moment for the world because you wept. I still remember what you said when you talked about the children not graduating or parents seeing them get married, et cetera. That was one of those things you couldn't get to go your way in yeah. terms of how do you look at it five years later? What do you say to yourself, especially given the number of mass shootings that we're still seeing in America? Well, I'll, 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 sep I'll, I'll talk about the specifics of, of you know, gun laws and gun safety laws, and then I'll talk uh, the broader uh, emotions around not having things go your way. Uh, look, uh, th this is a big, diverse, complicated country, which means that democracy can be frustrating. And uh, the way the gun issue has evolved in this country uh, reflects deeper and more complicated schisms in our society. Guns have become symbolic of a whole host of other issues and uh, how uh, those who live in the city of Chicago think about guns ends up being just very different than those who are living in rural Iowa. And some of that's justified, right? Uh, Michelle and I remember, I remember campaigning with her in Iowa and we went into somebody's farm and as we were driving out during twilight, uh, she said, you know, if, if I was living out on this farm, <laughs> I'd have a shotgun because <laughs> I don't know when the sheriff's going to respond uh, if some crazy person pulls off the highway uh, into my house. That's legitimate. Um, th th there's genuine... Uh, cultural affinities that are built around you know, a dad taking their kid out to go hunting for the first time. And, and, and that's real and that's legitimate and important. Um, but what, what has gotten tangled up in it is a combination of uh, the economic interests of gun manufacturers um, partisan politics, uh, the, the underlying um, uh, wars that you know, we've been seeing around uh, folks in, in certain parts of the country feeling as if they're ignored or uh, elites are looking down on them or what have you. And, and so it becomes this big cultural signifier and, and that combination has been toxic in getting just common sense stuff through. Um, and, and, and I actually believed that Sandy Hook was one of those moments of clarity when we might cut through all that nonsense and all that extra stuff because here were six-year-olds. I mean, you, you, you've got a, a, a young daughter, and and, um, and and the brutality that was visited on them was such where I remember going up to, because I was there only two days after it happened, um, the, the state police who were called in and had to deal with the site, um, they were all experiencing trauma and had to, and these were some hard, tough guys, and they had to uh, get counseling and take time off. It, it was, uh, 
heartbreaking. And, and so the assumption was, and, and, and I, I will be even more, uh, and I don't mean this to be controversial, but just to be honest, these were mostly middle-class white kids. And frankly, we have a tendency to um, expect somehow if it's you know, some teen black kids getting killed and shot. And so all, all, all these things uh, I thought would lead to not a great awakening, not a transformation, not some radical legislation, although that's what happened in Australia about 30 years ago was there was one serial killing and the whole country just said, well, this isn't worth it. <laughs> so no, that's what happened. Um, and they, and, and just, they, they just passed sweeping gun laws far more restrictive than anything we would even consider. Here, all we were talking about was some modest gun safety measures that would not have stopped the majority of gun-related deaths, but would have saved some people, would have stopped some potential killing spree. Uh, and the failure of Congress to act was, uh, I think, the angriest and most disappointing that I've ever been. Um, and, and probably the most surprised. I, I, that failure told me something's broken in our politics, that we could not respond. I mean, not one whit, uh, not, not, it wasn't like a watered down bill, it wasn't a compromise bill, it was nothing. And we just assumed hey, this, is, this is the price of doing business, that occasionally we'll have 26-year-olds killed. Um, and so, now, now, how did I deal with that? Well, um, you stay at it. You try something else. And, and we revisited what we could do uh, from a regulatory perspective, and we continued to advocate uh, and make some modest difference where we could. Um, but it wasn't satisfying. And, and, and one of the things that you uh, have to uh, uh, reconcile yourself with in the presidency, but r really any job of public responsibility, or for that matter, as a citizen that just wants to do right and participate in making the country better and the world better, is uh, you're going to fall short of what would be optimal. I mean, the Affordable Care Act was not my grand design for healthcare reform, but 20 million people got health insurance that didn't have it before. Now, 10 million. Um, you know, 10 million people still don't have it, in part because there were states where the governors, just for ideological reasons, would not take free money to expand Medicaid. Inexcusable. And, and we couldn't break through that, uh, although we tried and we picked off a couple over time. Um, but but you, have to, you have to feel, uh, I won't say content, but you have, to, you have to be at peace with the notion that you, you, you work and you work and you work, and then you, you get something done, not everything done. And I, and I always used to tell my team, and I, I tell my team to this day, um, if we're making something better than it was before, that's good. Better is good. And, 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 and that seems obvious, but oftentimes in, in, in politics, we don't think that way. We think, well, if, if, if we're not getting everything we wanted, if we had to make some compromises, if we fell short on this or that issue, um, that somehow uh, we should be disappointed uh, or give up. And, and I said, no. You, you, the, the sweep of history is, is that groups of people get an idea and they move it 
and they move it and they push the boulder up the hill and then you get to a little plateau and the boulder rests there for a second and you're, you're, the world's better than it was. And then you, somebody else or you start pushing the boulder back up. Um, and, and, and that's, uh, that's how you end up with a Civil Rights Act. That's how you end up with, you know, uh, the amendment allowing women to vote. That's how, that's how you end up with, uh, you know, the, all the benefits and freedoms that uh, a lot of people have fought for for years. I think it's interesting that I think it would be hard for us to imagine considering the grandness and the globalness and the historic nature of your presidency that the pragmatism is so clear. You know, it's just moving the ball down the field. Yeah. So when you think about that, and we pivot to the presidential center mm -hmm. that will be on the south side of Chicago, yeah. help us understand what that is. Well, um, you know, how is this it's gonna be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so. And thank you just, for bringing just it here. Let me, let me start. Uh, and, and I have to say, uh, Melody uh, has been one, one of the leaders that really uh, has helped to move this thing and, and uh, make it work, and, and so I could not be more grateful for, to her. And, uh, and, and there are a number of people in this room, so I'm not going to start naming them because I'll forget. Um, but, but it actually connects to what I've been saying earlier. Uh, uh, one lesson that I learned as president is that most of the big challenges we face, climate change or uh, economic inequality or an in, inadequate uh, education system, whatever your issue is, most of the time, what's preventing the problem from getting solved is not technical. Uh, it, it, it's typically not that we don't know what to do or we don't have uh, tools available to us that would move the ball down the field. Usually, uh, the reason change doesn't happen is because uh, people and politics and the, our, our failure to organize ourselves to be able to act in concert to get something done. And, and so when I was about to leave the White House and I had to ask myself, all right, I'm a pretty young guy. Uh, knock on wood, you know, I got some years left to, to, to make a contribution. What, what is the thing that, that Michelle and I could, could, could do that would have the biggest impact. And there will be issues that we care deeply about. And I just mentioned some of them, climate change, or uh, how do we make sure that there are enough well-paying jobs for uh, the next generation? And, and how do we uh, address uh, the criminal justice system so that it is more just? And, and I'll be working on all those things individually, but. The thing that I, th I believed would have the biggest impact is what if I could train the next generation of leadership to take the baton? What if I could make sure that it wasn't just training the people who got to go to the fanciest schools or uh, you know, were fast-tracked to corner offices or, you know, to work at Treasury, but people in local communities as well as those young people. Uh, what if we could make sure that it wasn't just restricted to one city or the country, but the world? Because as I've traveled around the world, I'd make a point of always meeting with young people from uh, the host countries, and we'd have a town hall and I'd have a discussion, and you would see these amazing young people who were doing incredible things in their local communities, uh, but were disconnected from each other, often under-resourced, didn't know how to scale up, uh, didn't know what path they might take in order to uh, accelerate uh, the work they were doing. 
And so uh, the presidential center that we're going to be building in Jackson Park, uh, alongside the University of Chicago and the Museum of Science and Industry, uh, will be a, a transformative tourist attraction, an economic engine for uh, the city of Chicago. Uh, it has the potential, I think, to transform the southern lakefront in a way that stitches together what Millennium Park has become and Museum Camp has become and what Lincoln Park has been for quite some time so that the city's no longer divided. Uh, and um, it, it promises to bring opportunity to communities that too often have been neglected. And the city of Chicago has never looked better. It has never been more spectacular. But if you ask people outside of Chicago, well, what about Chicago? The only thing they think about is crime rates and kids being shot. And that, that's a failure of our collective imaginations because we know what an extraordinary city this is. But it tells us that you can't just have half a city or three quarters of a city doing well if you want to be a, a, a true global city. Right? Um, and there the so, economic impact is huge because yeah, yeah. I read three to four billion dollars. Three, three, three to four billion dollars, uh, thousands of uh, initial jobs in construction, uh, uh, several thousand permanent jobs uh, generated uh, as a consequence. Um, so, but, but more concretely, uh, there will be a campus. It will have a museum, so you can come see Michelle's dresses and uh, our campaign buttons and uh, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but what I'm really most excited about is, is that it will house programming. And the goal of the programming will be to train, connect, uh, resource, con convene uh, this extraordinary generation of leadership that across sectors uh, that when they get together and are uh, thinking about problems, come up with remarkable solutions and are already doing amazing work. So we just had, some of you are aware, we just had uh, sort of a launching summit. We brought 500 of these young leaders together, half from the United States, half from overseas. And you would sit in a room and you'd watch some young woman in uh, Tanzania who had started uh, you know, health clinics for rural women, sitting next to uh, a gentleman from Appalachia who had started a STEM program for uh, towns that you know, had seen a decline in mining. And they're having a conversation and starting to trade ideas and figuring out how can they uh, work together and trading, you know, they're doing all that stuff with their phones that I can't do because it goes really fast. Um, and, uh, and, and so what we're going to have is, is tiers of programming. We'll, we'll have a tier of young leaders who are already doing amazing things but essentially just need more support. They need financing, they need technical training, they need uh, help with their media profiles, et cetera. Um, they might be uh, you know, combating AIDS, they might be doing work with respect to human trafficking, they might be a young entrepreneur who's come up with a great idea for uh, getting low-cost solar energy uh, into uh, rural areas, they might be uh, somebody who's figured out how to train ex-offenders uh, to connect with jobs. Uh, and so we'll work with them intensively, almost like a, a VC might work with uh, a, 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 not an early stage startup, but somebody who's, who's about to break through. Uh, a bigger category of young people that we want to work with are people like me when I first came into Chicago. Um, 
idealistic, have potential, but don't know what the heck they're doing or how they might have an impact on the world. And whether we do this in college campuses, whether we bring them on site for uh, trainings, uh, the idea here would be to, to give them a sense of how they can uh, act on the issues they care about. Some of them may want to go into politics. Some of them may be in the nonprofit sector. Some of them may want to go back and get their MBA, but right. want to be responsible in business for uh, creating a work environment and a community that is uh, reflective of their values, and we'll teach them how to do that. And then a third level will be a digital platform that we're going to build out uh, that has the capacity to reach millions, uh, where we want to teach young people as early as in uh, elementary school uh, or, or uh, high school, uh, basic civics, how they can get involved, how they can get engaged, how their government works, how their voice matters, uh, experimenting with uh, ways to, to create a better information environment so uh, young people don't grow up thinking that the news is just insulting people uh, or, um, or having glib uh, one-liners, but rather, uh, you know, how do you evaluate uh, your world and, and what's your place in it? I know we're running short. I want to make sure we understand mm -hmm. in this room because there's so much power and influence yeah. here. What is it that we can do to help move this along? Well, I to will make be very the... specific. Yeah. Thank you. Because I think Thank that you, this Melody, is a two-way street. Thank you, for teeing this up. Well, I did you're... not expect this question, but I, will... I just happen to have a handy answer. Um, but you're bringing something very important yeah. to our city, but more importantly to the world in terms yeah. of the change that could be affected. Yeah. And it's one thing for us to all admire the problems that exist right. today. It's another to actually do something about it. I'm sure we'll all visit, but I think there's probably more. Well, right that, now there's nothing to visit because no, we haven't built it when it's yet, open, which is, but I would, I would assume yeah. you'd hope more of us. Yeah. What would you want? Well, well l l let, me, let me say this. Uh, um, Michelle and I decided this had to be here because this city's given us so much. Uh, it gave me Michelle. <laughs> it, uh, she grew up in South Shore. My daughters were born at the University of Chicago Hospital. That's where they went to school. I got my start in public life uh, in, in the same community where we're building the center. So, so uh, we owe so much to the city. Um, and, you know, uh, this is a big project, so uh, when all is said and done, you know, I will be bringing close to a billion dollars uh, to the city, uh, both in the bricks and mortar and to the programming. Um, but this isn't ultimately for me, right? Th this is for Malia and Sasha, it is for your kids, uh, the, the notion is this becomes a university for social change. This becomes a university, uh, a hub for leadership. Uh, and this becomes a, a beacon for the kinds of values that I was talking about earlier that have made America to this point the envy of the world. And by locating it here in Chicago, we find a, a great experiment uh, or a, a great laboratory for that work because Chicago is as representative, I believe, of America as any city on, in the country. It's north, south, east, west. It, it, there's every kind of person. There is every uh, element of our economy is represented here. Um, but it's also gonna be a, a global fo focal point. Look, I was just in China and India. We, we have uh, about a million young people around the world who are already part of uh, sort of a, a Obama Global Alumni Network. I hear the Indians love them some Obama. They do, I, I will say. <laughs> um, so, so it gives us, it, it, it becomes yet another anchor for uh, viewing Chicago as a global city. Um, but because 
ultimately this is not for me and Michelle, because we purposely weren't interested in just building uh, a you know, mausoleum or you know, a, 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 you know, a place to, to come idolize uh, the Obamas, but rather a living, breathing thing. We need Chicago involved in it. Uh, and th there are a couple of ways that you can get involved. I mean, number one, we've got to raise money. And the bulk of the dollars for this project will come from outside of Chicago, but frankly, in terms of bricks and mortar and the economic development benefits that will accrue to Chicago and the ability to show that, to, to use this as a bridge between the two Chicago's so that they feel connected. Um, yeah, it's harder to persuade folks in San Francisco to do bricks and mortar as opposed to programming here. And so we're gonna need help. Uh, and the Civic Committee has been active and involved and there have been already companies like Exelon who've shown extraordinary leadership and, and we're grateful for that. Um, but but I'm, I'm hopeful that all of you Think about this the same way that you thought about Millennium Park, the same way that you thought about uh, the amazing additions to the Art Institute or Museum Campus, that this is part of your legacy as Chicagoans. Uh, and I want us to do this jointly in partnership. The second thing is that we are going to want your expertise and involvement in training the young people. Because although I mentioned amazing young leaders who are already uh, doing great stuff, part of what we're also gonna be doing is a continuation of the My Brother's Keeper program that mentors disadvantaged uh, young men of color who are too often uh, heading towards jail. We wanna intervene and make sure they're going to college instead uh, through mentorship programs and uh, providing resources uh, so that they uh, can aspire higher. Michelle is gonna continue her work with Let Girls Learn, which involves, for example, ensuring there's sufficient STEM education resources. So that we got women as engineers and scientists uh, and, and breaking down barriers there. Um, and so many of you have connections and contacts and within your companies, it, you occupy worlds that kids can't imagine. And it's not that hard for you to open your doors and just show them what's possible. And, and the impacts that arise out of that or the, the ways in which you can partner with us uh, in that kind of work is gonna be extraordinary. Uh, so that's the second thing. So the Obama Foundation is open for business. They can pick up the phone and call. We are ready to go uh, in the other room uh, David Seamus uh, is our extraordinary uh, executive director. He was one of my top advisors at the White House. He's now uh, moved to Chicago uh, in part for mission, in part because his wife loved Chicago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so does uh, his, his younger daughter, uh, who's now going to lab. Uh, and so, uh, David is, is based out of Hyde Park. We've got offices there, and we want uh, all of you to, uh, uh, to reach out to us. But if not, we're going to reach out to you. We know, <laughs> we know where you live, as they say. Uh, so we will find you. But, but, but uh, you know, just a closing point on this, uh, Melody. Uh, um, th this is going to work. And the reason I know it's going to work is because I travel around the world, and for those who are right now feeling kind of discouraged and depressed and think the world's kind of spinning off its axis a little bit, uh, you, you talk to a, a gathering of a couple hundred young people, and I just did it in New Delhi, but I've done it in Johannesburg, I've done it in uh, Italy, I've, I've done it uh, uh, all across the United States, they will make you feel good about the future. The, the challenge they have is not 
that they aren't instilled with the values that we discussed earlier. It's not that they don't want to make a difference. Uh, it's not that they're will not willing to work hard. Uh, the problem is, is that the institutions that used to get young people involved in our public and our civic lives, those things have broken down. You know, uh, the, 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 the neighborhood organizations and the churches and the uh, local businesses, et cetera, it, it means we're all atomized and split apart. And so these young people have all this amazing talent and idealism, but they don't know how to link up except on the internet and through hashtags and, and, and all that energy gets dissipated. And this is a way for us to, to harness that. And, I, and, and when you're with them and you see what they're accomplishing and what, how excited and energized and focused uh, and productive they end up being uh, when they're together, um, you will feel inspired, you will feel good about it. Uh, the world at a time when sometimes uh, that's, uh, that's hard to do. All right, so I, we were so over time, but I'm gonna end with two really quick, that clock, clock was not correct when we I'm sat sure it down. was, but that's no, okay. No, it was not. It was 10 Man, minutes. Man, I'm gonna get home late. Okay, I'm gonna ask you two really quick things. So the first one is just curious. When you sit around with the living presidents and you're chit-chatting <laughs> about your lives, what do you all say you most miss about being president? Hmm. I, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, uh, we don't sit around chitting and chatting that much. You look um, like you're having a <laughs> But we had a good time uh, down in Houston uh, when we uh, were, were doing uh, fundraising there for, for hurricane relief. Um, I, I, think, I think I speak for the ex-presidents when I say uh, they don't spend a lot of time reminiscing. I think there's a, there's a sense of that was an extraordinary adventure. Uh, I think everybody gets a sense of pride in work they did, some regrets in things that were left undone, uh, but that uh, you have to look forward. Um, I can say personally the things I miss. Um, uh, and it's actually a surprisingly short list. I, I don't miss the pomp and circumstance of the presidency. I didn't expect to. Uh, I don't miss, you know, having, you know, 500 cars surrounding me when I get off a plane and saluting and, uh, you know, uh, uh, having, a, you know, to sit down at some dinner with all kinds of silverware and stuff. And, <laughs> you know, I, 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 like, like I, I, I don't miss all that stuff. Um, I miss the Truman Balcony, which is a great view, especially during the summer. You look out and there's the uh, Washington Monument, and behind that is uh, the Jefferson Memorial. And on a, on, a, on a clear summer night, and the stars are twinkling and the monuments are lit up, um, it's inspiring. Uh, and gives you a sense of perspective. I miss that. I miss um, Air Force One when I'm flying around the world. <laughs> I don't miss it day to day, but like on the trip that I just took, literally around the world in five days, uh, like this, my cabin with, with the bed and all that, there's a shower. That was really helpful. So I miss that. Um, but I miss Marine One more because, frankly, I know a number of people with planes, but not that many people have helicopters. <laughs> and, and you can really cut down on traffic. Uh, so, so I miss that, I confess. Um, and the third thing I miss is you know, we had these wonderful music series. Um, some of them were broadcast. Uh, some of them, we just decided to have a party. And like, for example, the last time I saw Prince was uh, um, a couple months before he died. He actually performed at a party for us. Melody was there. He was really good. Um, but 
you know, uh, I, I remember, and this is probably a good place to end unless well. um, you have some burning question. Um, but I remember uh, there, there's something called the Gershwin Awards that we didn't even know about, but it turns out there's this thing called the Gershwin Awards, and it goes to sort of a hall of fame for songwriters. And uh, the honoree, I think it was the first year, but it might have been the second, uh, was Paul McCartney. And I've gotten to know Paul McCartney, and he's a wonderful guy, and amazing stories that he can tell about the Beatles getting started and so forth. But um, that first time we met, the way it's organized is a bunch of musicians come and do tributes, and obviously McCartney's got a lot of songs, so uh, it was easy to select uh, all these amazing artists to, to uh, do these numbers. And then at the end, McCartney came out and he performed. And, and this is all in the East Room, which is a very small room for those of you uh, relative to something, a ballroom like this. I mean, it probably seats maybe 200 people. Um, and Michelle and I are sitting in the front row and McCartney starts playing some songs. And then at, at some point, he says, uh, I'd like to dedicate this to the First Lady. And he starts singing, yeah, Michelle, my bell, these are words. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, so what are the odds <laughs> that this little black girl from the south side of Chicago, you know, in 1968 or 69, you know, right before the Beatles broke up, when they were already, according to John Legend, bigger than Jesus, that you fast forward 40 years later and Paul McCartney's singing to that little girl. Uh, and, and what does that say about what's possible? Uh, and, and what does that say about the little girls right now who are on the south side of Chicago? And, 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 and what kinds of chances are we giving them? What kinds of talents are we missing if, if we're not providing them with uh, the kind of opportunities and pathways that I had and Michelle had and that you had? Um, so I remember that. I miss that. Um, that particular kind of moment that you can get uh, in the White House. It's, it's not the glitz of it, but it's uh, a reminder of, of, of uh, the possibilities of human life. That so anyway, all right, I got to go. Thank you, everybody. So it's safe to say we miss you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Barack Obama. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, everybody.